Well, good morning. You may know the story on May 10th. It was 1748, quite some time ago, off the, the coast of Ireland, that uh, a young man, not a religious man at the time, actually one who was on a trip purchasing slaves. He was a slave owner. He was a slave trader, and he found himself caught in a horrific sea storm. And again, not being a religious man, not quite sure how to respond, he felt an urge to drop to his knees on this ship. And so there in the middle of the storm, out off that coast of Ireland, he began to pray. The boat would actually hit rocks near the shore, and a hole would be ripped through uh, the vessel, through uh, the front part of the boat, and the boat would begin to take on water. And this man began to just simply pray, Lord, have mercy on me. Well, miraculously, the, the cargo shifted and covered that exact hole where water had once poured in, and, but by the grace of God, the ship made it to shore and everyone on the ship survived. And it would be just days after that this slave trader and owner would walk away from that horrifically uh, insane and, and terrible industry. He would give his heart to the Lord and he would actually become a minister. And he penned more than 280 hymns. His hymns have actually appeared in more than 11,000 movies and have been in over or recorded in over 20,000 albums and performed annually. Get this, one of his songs in particular, it is estimated, is performed annually more than 10 million times. His name is John Newton, and he wrote these ever popular lyrics. You've sung them before. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but what? But now I see. Countless, countless, countless times you probably have said these words or saying these words. These words have been a, a source of encouragement to so many people. And as we turn our attention to the book of Job today, we're going to continue in this wisdom literature series, and we're going to read words that too have been a tremendous source of hope and encouragement for so many people. I said this last week, here's the definition of wisdom literature. Wisdom literature was this, this category of literature in olden times that brought comfort and that really dealt with the workings of the world and offered common sense approach to life. And the actual definition I gave you was this, writings, this is wisdom literature, writings that give instructions for living well while discussing both the challenges and the difficulties of life. And I gave you five books, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Today, we're going to jump headstrong into the book of Job, and it's going to be a great study for us. Will you stand up and say good morning to someone, share a little love with someone, tell them you're glad they're here. We're going to open the word in just a moment. I'm glad you're with us. All right, let me have a word of prayer with you this morning. So glad you're with us. I always enjoy watching you enjoy getting to say good morning to one another. My name is Jeffrey. I'm one of the pastors here and excited to jump into the word with you this morning. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, we just want to thank you for another day. What a privilege it is to be in your presence. And we're so thankful for the power of your presence. We're so thankful for your word that you've given to us. And Lord, we pray today that as we look at a, a difficult read in Scripture and one that comes to a conclusion and often leaves us as readers still with many questions, we pray that you would be our source of answers, that you would be our peace, and that you truly would be our hope. We thank you for the wisdom found in these truths. And Lord, I pray that it speaks to us today. And we ask this in your name. Amen. You guys grab a seat. Wisdom literature. We unpacked it last week and discussed an overview. Today, we're going to look at wisdom literature book number one, the book of Job. And last week, I presented the big question of this book, and that is this. Can God be trusted? A secondary question might be, well, why, does, why does God allow or why 
do bad things seemingly happen to those who might call themselves good people? It's a complex read at best. It's a, a series of issues in this book of Job. If you have your Bible with you, we are obviously not going to read the entirety of the book in this one sitting. This is really a, a unique study for us. Each week we're going to look at a different book. And it's a very challenging study for us, not just because of the content involved, but just the idea of going through a book in a little more than a half hour is going to be challenging at best. And so a, a lot I want to share with you, but we're going to begin in, in Job chapter 1. But Job is this, this book, rather than just tackling one issue, there's really a series of issues presented to us. The suffering of the innocent and the idea of a righteous one whom has... It, seems done things right and well and lived a life God honoring is tested? And then what do you do in these moments? Turning to whom or to what in times of tragedy? Did I say that word right, Amy? Tragedy? There we go. Okay, she says, I think so. So uh, last week I gave you two goals that really are my goals for the series. If you didn't write them, you may want to write them this morning. I'll, I'll put them on the screen for you. You can also follow along uh, in the app. But the, the goal for us is to discover twofold. Number one, the truth of God's Word and that God's Word truly is timeless. Amen, church. And secondly, to discover that when I lean into the Word of God and I choose to apply these truths to my life, that I will find peace whether this is really important, whether my circumstances do or do not change. This is, this is really important. And we're going to unpack this today. A, a, a lot of scripture. Let's jump in. Job chapter 1, a lot to look through in this book. And we're going to learn a lot just in these first five verses if you want to read along with me. In the land of Uz there lived, verse 1, chapter 1, the book of Job, a man whose name was Job. Now listen to the description the, the word gives us of this man. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. He had a large number of servants and he was the greatest man among all the people of the east. What a powerful statement to be said of someone, the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes and their, their birthdays, or on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters, and they would eat, and they would drink. We've already learned a lot right here. Let me give you a couple of things here. Number one, Job, Scripture tells us, is blameless, and he's upright. This is what we read right here at the beginning of verse 1. This man was blameless. And upright. It appears this man, if you've read, studied Job before, then you, you know it, it appears this, this man is one of personal integrity. His integrity meant everything to him. The Hebrew word that we see here, actually two words for the word blameless and for the word upright. You may want to write this this morning. This Hebrew word for blameless, T A M, means an absence of blame or guilt. And to be upright in the Hebrew, I really, really enjoyed this definition, means to behave according to the expectations of God. What an aspiration for us all. We really could end right here. We could talk about these two words and unpack them in great detail. But this is what we learn of Job, that he was this man who was blameless. He is a man who is upright. And I think it's important to note, he's not a man sinless. No man is sinless. Even Job admits in chapter 7, verse 21, that he is a man of sin. When he says, why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sin? So he's, he's not sinless, and that, again, is important to note. I want to give you two questions already that have surfaced for me just in the first four, five verses as I have studied this just countless times this week, and I was brought to these two questions about my job, or not my job, about Job and my life, and I want to give you these questions for consideration, and the two questions are this. Will you just consider, maybe write, or at least ponder in your heart, am I one? Think about this. Am I one whose personal integrity means everything to me? Will you ask that question this morning? You're going to be forced a lot throughout Scripture in this study 
to really look at the lives of those or, or the verses that we, the, that we read through these, these five books in this wisdom literature package of books in the Old Testament. And you're going to be forced to hold the mirror before yourself. So here, here's a great question. Am I one whose personal integrity means everything to me? And secondly, in what area or in what areas of my life can I better walk upright? What a great question for us. The, the Hebrew word yasar, upright, means to behave according to God's expectations. So, so already, guys, we're, we're forced to really pause. I mean, it's a, it's a heavy study. We're, we're forced to pause and really think about the character of our own lives. And are there ways in which we can strive to better walk upright and walk righteous, walk according to, to God and his will and his plan? This is who Job was. Number one, he was a blameless and upright man. Secondly, Job feared God. It says this. He was blameless, he was upright in verse one, and he feared God. I thought about this question several times throughout the week. What does it mean to fear God? Have you ever thought about this? What, what does it mean to fear God? Well, well, the answer to the question really presents another question. That question being, does the one fearing God have a relationship with God? Because if you don't have a relationship with God, then fearing God is different for you than if you do have a relationship with with God. For one who does not fear the Lord, fear can be extremely paralyzing and it can be extremely overwhelming. It's a fear based upon the judgment of God. Hebrews 10 31 says, It is dreadful. Everyone say dreadful. Hey guys, it is dreadful, scripture says. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's some serious fear. Luke chapter 1 says, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, look at this, after your body has been killed, meaning after you die, it's not over for you. If you do not know Jesus as Savior, then fear for you is a fear that lasts eternally. Because after you have been killed, Scripture says, this one you should fear has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. To the unbeliever, here's what fear is. It's judgment and death. You may want to write that this morning. Job is a man who feared God. He wasn't an unbeliever. So to know the Lord, fear is completely different for one who, who knows him, who believes in him, believes what Scripture says, that, that God created us and has a plan for us and sent his son Jesus to die for us, and he forgave every sin. He went to the cross, past, present, and future, died for all sins, came back to life, proved the fact he is the Savior of the world. And when you choose to surrender your life to him, it's a completely and entirely different fear under which you live. To the believer, fear isn't judgment and death. Instead, look at the screen, it's reverence in this life. It is reverence and it's life. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Everyone say consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. We're encouraging you to read a proverb a day with our church this week. So you just find the day of the month that we're in and you read that Proverbs and how super fun it is to know that we're all reading the same thing. We hope you're taking this challenge. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Job chapter 1, this man was blameless and upright and he feared God. And thirdly, what does it say? Number three, Job shunned evil. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God, and he shunned evil. The Hebrew word shunned actually means reject. It doesn't mean dance around it or sometimes dabble in it. No, it means to completely reject. Job is a man who rejected evil. He didn't just try to live upright. He actively rejected evil when it came his way. Number four, he was greatly blessed. He was greatly blessed. Look at verses 2 or just listen to verses 2 and 3. He had seven sons, three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. It had a large number of servants. Ten children. He amassed a large wealth in livestock. 500 yoke of auction, uh, auction of oxen, 
It says, actually, a thousand, since a yoke of oxen is two, so he has a thousand oxen. In these times, pe- people measured how blessed a man was in one of two ways. Number one, in how many children they had, and number two, in the stuff they had, specifically the, the wealth of their, their livestock. Scripture is letting us know that this is a very, very, very wealthy, blessed man. Number five, Job was enormously popular. He was respected. It says he was the greatest man among all the peoples of the east. The greatest in the Hebrew actually means revered. Think about this. So Job is the most revered man in all of the east. It isn't just that people think a lot of him. He is the most revered man in all of the east. He is respected, revered, enormously popular, And number six, Job protected, I really, really, really want us to spend some time on this one. Job protected the spiritual integrity of his family. This one's really important, guys. You should circle this one. If you're taking notes today, you should put a star beside this. Or you should tattoo this on the forefront of your heart. Job protected the spiritual integrity of of his family. His sons, verse 4, used to hold feasts, probably birthday celebrations, but maybe not always. It says here often, though, that it was in their homes on their birthdays. They would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And look what verse 5 says, a period of feasting would run its course. And Job, think about this, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. How would he do this? Well, he wouldn't, listen, he wouldn't procrastinate. He wouldn't think about it for a while. No, it says, early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And it says that this was Job's regular custom. So Job, think about this, guys. Job acted like this this priestly leader in his home. And this, in many ways, is the act of a, a, a priest in the Old Testament, uh, of sacrificing. And we know that this specific kind of sacrifice was a consuming fire sacrifice, meaning that the animal being sacrificed would completely be burnt. It would completely, uh, I guess, uh, be left with nothing other than ashes. It's a complete sacrifice of fire. We see Joseph Joseph. Job is doing this because of, it says here, this idea, you should write down this word, of purity. That really spoke out to me, that he wants to purify his family. Here is a man that so desires to live this this life that shuns evil, that he has even taken the steps to make sure that his family is purified. This all-consuming fire, this, this, this reverence, this holy burnt offering. He's atoning. Here's what he's doing, guys. He's atoning for the sins of his family. That's a very popular, very popular idea, and not just a popular one, but a holy one that we see in in the Old Testament, one of reverence, of, of sacrificing to make an atonement for sins. And here we find a man wanting to do so to cover his family. And men, this really, for every father, for every granddaddy in the room, this really pushed me to think more and more about my responsibility this week. I want, I want to give a question to all the men. Ladies, you can, you can dive in here as, as well if this, if this fits for you and your family dynamic. But I specifically, because we, we see this being a man who does such, I specifically want to share this with the men this morning. And just a question on the screen I want you just to present to your heart. The question is this, do I work to furiously protect the spiritual integrity of my family? Men, think about this. Do I work to spiritually protect my family's integrity? Now, there's a countless ways we could talk about you doing this. I wrote down a few. Furiously protecting the spiritual integrity of my family could be, number one, men realizing that my family looks to me as the spiritual leader in the home. Because this is true, men. Your family looks to you for moral, for spiritual for relational guidance. They're they're looking to you, whether you realize it or not, whether you take responsibility for it or not. Your children, your your spouse looks to you as that spiritual leader in the home. The question isn't, are you leading? The question is, how are you leading? I also think it's important, and you know this about me, that it's really fun sometimes just to 
rock a good daddy joke, and I see one of my daughters right now who is up in the booth running the slides this morning, and she's already laughing because she knows this is going to be really, really bad, but you know, a part of us being daddies is, I think, a part of cracking jokes. Stephen gave me a joke this week. I didn't ask you, but I'm going to use it. I hope that's okay. It's actually the second one. Here's the first daddy joke. You guys probably know this. French fries weren't actually first cooked in France. You know this, don't you? Yeah, they were cooked in Greece. Studies show that. Studies, <laughs> studies actually, studies do show this, and and, and here's the one. This one's a really good daddy joke. So why, this is so bad, I'm going to stumble on this one. Why does the Norway Navy, you have to really focus on this. Why does the Norway Navy have barcodes on the sides of their ships? I mean, if, if you go to Nor- Norway, you'd see this. They have these, these barcodes actually on the sides of their ships. Why is this the case? So that when the ships come back to port, they can scan the Navy in. S- scan the Navy in. Scan. That was your joke. So they're really not laughing at you. I thought it was hilarious, but so men, we're the spiritual leaders of our homes, and sometimes we, we crack a joke, and I think it really, I know from my daughters, we, we just, we have so much fun. We cracked a lot of jokes this weekend. We went to Franklin and had a really good time. Number three, lead the charge, men. Listen, lead the charge. Let me say it again. Lead the charge in establishing and encouraging the mission statement of your family. We talked about this a year ago. Right out a year ago, we did a study called Family Strong, and we talked about what it means to be a family on point, a family on mission. And so, hey, if you haven't done this in a while, I'm going to encourage you to jump back in, and you'll find a family mission statement packet at all of our exits today at the Welcome Center, and to my left and to my right uh, on the pub tables. But we have updated this and just really encouraged you to think about what it means to customize as a family the mission of your family. We want to encourage you when it comes to all things your family life, the TV shows you watch and your commitment to God's Word and how you spend time as a family and how you deal with discipline and everything and in between on either side and in the middle. It's important that we stay on point as families. We do this here at the church. We talk about our mission often. You heard Kara mention our mission statement this morning. And so I think it's important that as families striving to honor God, Heck, families desiring to be like Job, Job was this man on point. Again, it didn't say that he, that he just casually approached this idea of purifying his family, but it says early in the morning, repetition. This man was about repetition in leading the charge and establishing and encouraging his family. He probably wouldn't have called it a mission statement, but he was a man on mission. Here's another thing that Job did that really speaks to me, or at least I want to believe that he did this, and this is who I want to be as a daddy. Create opportunities just to connect with your family. We did this this weekend. The girls head off to college next week. I can't believe it. We're about to be empty nesters, and I I can't even focus on it. I can't even think about the idea of silence upstairs. I'm not going to let my heart go there today. But we as a family went away, and I'm knowing that we're just days away from the second floor being dark and quiet for a while. So anyway, we wanted to get away, and we went to Franklin, and we just had a great time as, as a family. I love to do this. You guys know I love to create these family moments. And men, I just want to remind you, you don't always have to take the lead here, but I tell you what, your family desires they look to they expect that you take the lead on creating connection moments and I do know this I get the attention of my children when I give my children my attention it's just it's just true I I get their attention when I give them attention and I just want to create families whatever your family dynamic is that you look for opportunities to be like Job Job was a blameless and upright man he feared God he shunned evil He was enormously popular and respected, meaning he was spiritually revered. And we know this. He worked to protect the spiritual integrity of his home. Go to to Job chapter 1, verse 6. I want us to read on here. And we're going to see the story shift. And it, it shifts to actually a scene in heaven when Satan... Get this, standing before God insists that Job is only the righteous man that he is because God has allowed him to be blessed. Look at verse 6. One day the angels came to represent themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. We looked at this verse a few weeks ago in our study on the snake, and this is proof that Satan roams the earth, and he watches, and he waits. And the Lord says to Satan in verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. 
He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Interestingly, do you notice what God says about Job? It's the same thing we read about Job in verse 1. God is saying the same thing that we've just read Scripture say. God is saying, hey, this is a man, a righteous man. He is blameless, he is upright, he fears me, and he shuns evil. Verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. (laughs) The Lord said to Satan, very well, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And then it says that Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he probably went out and got his, his plan together. Hey, before we unpack what happens next, there's one sentence I want to draw your attention to, one sentence that really speaks to me about who I want to be and who I desire that that God say I am. It's in verse 8. I wonder if you caught this verse as we were reading this. I was drawn back to this verse often throughout the week, and I I tell you, I'm not here, and I, I sure want to be here. I hope that I can aspire for such, but look at what the Lord says of Job, I so desire the Lord to be able to say this of me. Have you considered my servant Job, the Lord says? There is no one on earth like him. Man, shouldn't we aspire for such? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God, and one who shuns evil. God gives Satan freedom to do what he desires. Look at verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing nearby, the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Imagine. While he was still speaking, another messenger came. The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. I can't imagine. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword. I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. And it collapsed on them, and they are dead. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Within seconds, Job loses everything. He loses his oxen and his donkeys and his his sheep. He loses his camels and all but three of his servants. And then he loses a house in which his children were partying. And then he loses all of the ten children, everyone but one servant, in this house. I mean, imagine, most likely Job buries all of his kids on the same day. I can't fully speak to the, what I can only imagine is overwhelming grief. Some of you have been in such a situation of having to bury a child. I can't imagine. But I'm amazed at the response of Job after losing everything. Look at verse 20. At this, Job got up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said in verse 21, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised in all of this. Verse 22, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I tell you guys, this book, it's just, it's packed. We're just, we're just ending chapter one. It's just packed with so much. I want to, I want to pause here because two things are revealed to me about our response to tragedy that Job does. And I, before we move on, I, I want you to see this, this response to devastation. When facing devastation, I learned two things here that I'm to do. Number one, I'm to mourn. 
That's an important part of the journey too. To remove one's robe, to shave one's head was a sign of distress and mourning in the Old Testament. It's important to take time to mourn. Life is hard. Difficulty, seasons of life, unavoidable tragedies, brokenness is a part of each of our stories. And Job reminds us that it is normal and it is natural to mourn. And it's a process through which we should not move quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're going to study this book in a few weeks. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. You should write this sentence this morning. To mourn well is to heal whole. And mourning must be a part of our story. And we see this in Job in his response. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, Isaiah 22, called you on that day to weep and to well, to tear out your hair and to put on sackcloth. He mourns. But he doesn't just stop there, does he, church? Are you still with me? If you're with me, say, Jeffrey, I'm with you. He doesn't just stop here. Look at what he does. He mourns and he worships. The act of tearing his robe and shaving his head, this isn't the only thing that Job does in this situation. Verse 20, he got up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground. The Hebrew here for fell to the ground is a posture that is prostrate. He falls to the ground. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Guys, this is, <laughs> this is really, really good here. The, this, this Hebrew word here of his posture is the word H-A-W-A-H. Look at what this word means. It isn't just a realization. It isn't just mourning. No, no look at, look at his, the response of Job's heart. The realization and the acknowledgement that God has done a significant act. Job realizes here that God has done a significant act. We only see this Hebrew word four other times in the entirety of the Bible. And every time we see it, it is a person's response to something miraculous, something significant that the Lord has done. Job, in the same way as we see Four other times in Scripture, I won't walk you through that today, Job responds acknowledging, prostrate, that the Lord has performed a remarkable act and all he can do is worship. And what a powerful, powerful moment in Scripture, particularly in light of the fact that he's lost all of his children. Do you notice the first words out of his mouth? Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will depart. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. This is actually your 52 and 22 this week. Guys, I hope you're staying the journey on this. We're, we're past the halfway point as a church and memorizing passages throughout this year in 2022. We are corporately memorizing 52 passages. I see here, or I guess it's what I don't see here. He doesn't, he doesn't focus on the loss he focuses on the reality that this is a moment in which he must praise the Lord. And what a powerful, a powerful moment in story. And guys, we're just, we're just getting started. Look at Jude, Jude, uh, Job chapter 2. I keep calling it Jude and Joseph. I don't know what's wrong with my head today. But look at Job chapter 2. Because really, we're, we're just getting going. And, and, and Satan, he's, he's tried and it hasn't gone so well. So he's back at it. Verse 1, chapter 2. Another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered, from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity. Do you see this? God knows the heart of Job, and even though he has lost almost everything in his life, look what God says about him. He still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. 
Well, Satan jumps right back in. He fires off once more. Verse 4, skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Have you, have you been so afflicted with sores that you actually take a piece of broken pottery and scrape your body? That's what Job does here. He took a piece of broken pottery, verse 8, scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. The ashes of what? The ashes falling from his body. His wife said to him, mm, it's a tough part of the story. Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. His wife. Now, we've read three times now where Scripture says, that Job is a blameless man. He is upright. He fears God. He shuns evil. He's revered in the community. And he's a man of integrity. The whole community, everyone in the East knows who this man is. Everyone in the East, including his wife. We've read all these descriptions of this man whose heart is a heart bent towards the Lord. But yet in one response... We read that the person who knows him more than anyone other than the Lord says that, look at it again, you should just curse God and die. And I've thought about this all week as well, guys. I've thought about the power of my words. I've thought about difficult situations and how I respond to them. If Amy were to stand up this morning, she would say, I don't get this right often. And I often allow the emotion of situations and circumstances to, to lead me to maybe say some things I shouldn't, and think some, some ways I shouldn't. I sure hope, though, that, that when Amy comes to me, that I'm not as Job's spouse in encouraging Amy because of her difficulties of life to curse God and die. Throughout the week, I've thought, and I've made a lot of notes, and I want to give you a couple before we look at a final thought of what it means to be one who offers godly counsel rather than just silly words. And then I thought about our students. We're going to celebrate our kiddos in just a few moments. School has started back, or it's about to start back, and we're going to end in just a few moments by giving you just a, just a little gift to take home and to encourage your heart to be one of prayer this school year. Whether you have kids or not, it'll be just a great exercise for our church. And I want to say this to everyone, but specifically to all of our students. For every kiddo in the room, I want you to look at the screen. Because here's, here's a great question for you as it relates to the friends and your, your circle of influence. Look, look at the screen, and I want you to consider every student in the room. Do my closest friends push me closer or pull me away from God? It's a great time to consider such. Some of you have been away from a lot of your friends over the summer, but now you're, you're in the rhythm or you're about to be back in the rhythm of spending time with your circle of influence. Ask yourself. This can be a great exercise for all of us, but particularly for our kiddos, the, the people you call close friends. Do they push you closer to God? Or do they pull you away from God in the things they encourage you to do? And here we have... Job's wife, and in one statement, obviously she is not pushing Job closer. She says, curse God, and then go ahead and die. Imagine if you heard that from a spouse. Curse God and die. You didn't take out the trash? Curse God and die. <laughs> Can you imagine her words? I mean, she sees what her husband has gone through. She too has lost so much of their wealth. All ten of their children. And her counsel to her husband is curse God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, just like that of a viper, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. He also said this in Luke chapter 6, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. 
Job's wife offers counsel, but it's not godly counsel, is it? Here's a couple of thoughts when it comes to the, the words you say. And, I, and I'm posing the thought like this, God's wisdom or human's words? Because th- there truly is a difference. God's wisdom or human words? A couple of thoughts real quickly. Number one, not all counsel is godly, and we must remember this. Not all counsel that we receive for every kiddo in the room today, listen, you, you receive counsel from your friends every day. But just because they say it, and just because they say you're their friend, doesn't mean what they're saying, what they're offering, is what's best for you. Not all counsel is godly. Proverbs chapter 30, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Hey, let me just remind everyone in the room, but particularly our kiddos, look at the screen here. If a person's suggestions, if their recommendations or condemnations aren't in sync with God's, then such counsel, period, is wrong. No matter how popular, culturally relevant, or accepted this person is, their words are, no matter how culture cool this person is, no matter how much this person means to you, if a person's suggestions, recommendations, or condemnations aren't in sync with God's, then they're not in sync with God's. And no matter how popular the, the word, culturally relevant it is, how accepted this person is, their counsel is wrong. Not all counsel is godly. Secondly, not all counsel is popular. Not all counsel is popular. Saying what is right won't always sit right with everyone. The word of God is divisive and it is offensive. First Peter chapter 2 says this, I lay a stone in Zion. Look at the screen. A chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble. Listen, guys, it is not always popular to offer counsel that is godly. It is not always popular to stand for what is right and to preach what is right. But hey, I want to pause and say this also just real quickly. I want to make this very clear to all. I want you to hear this. I want you to share this in your circle of influence. I want to make sure that everyone in the room clearly hears this. We, from this pulpit and in this ministry, on this campus and all things that Donaldson First stands for, we do not preach hate. And I want to make that very clear. We do not preach hate. I have never preached hate. I will not preach hate. You may not like what I say sometimes, but you can't label it as hate because it's not hate. Sometimes what we say, what we study, what we unpack in God's truth, it hurts. It's not fun. It goes against the lifestyles of our friends and some of our family members. Sometimes in Scripture we read things, we study things, we unpack things, and we get to them and we're like, you know, it would probably be easier just to jump over this because we don't want to offend anyone. That's not who we are here. So sometimes we've got to walk through the Word and it just doesn't feel good when we're on the other side of it. But God's word isn't here. Listen, God's word isn't here for a feel good. And Donaldson First doesn't exist for a feel good. And that means sometimes, yeah, that means sometimes we're going to tackle some things that aren't going to be popular. But I want to make it clear. Just because it's not popular doesn't mean it's hate. And I hope you'll be a voice that never says such. Because that's an incorrect voice. It is not always popular to preach godly counsel. Number three, godly counsel needs God's counsel. And this is a really important one. Job's wife misled him. His friends didn't do much better. Well, I mean, at at first they did. In Job chapter two, it says in verse 11, Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and to comfort him. His friends meant well. His friends really did mean well initially. They saw him from a distance. Can you imagine this? They could hardly recognize him, the sores that are on his body. They began to weep. They tore their robes. They sprinkled dust on their heads. And then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, and nobody said a word because they saw how great his suffering was. These are some really good friends. Unfortunately, In Job 5 and in Job 8 and in Job 11, their counsel they offered wasn't godly. 
As a matter of fact, let's, let's just look at one. Look at what Zophar says. This is Job chapter 11. This is verse 11. Because his friend Zophar is looking at him and he's assuming that because of the way he looks and the loss he suffered, he must have done wrong. It's not godly counsel, but he just allows his assumptions to get the best of him. And he says this in chapter 11, verse 11. Surely he recognizes deceivers, speaking of God. Surely he recognizes deceivers. And when he sees evil, does he not take note? So one of his closest friends is saying, God must have recognized you as a deceiver. And so because he sees evil in you, he's taken note. And you're just paying the price. He's saying, come on, Job, don't you get it? You've deceived God and your sinful life has gotten the best of you. And now, you're just paying the price. I guess let me, re- let me remind you when it comes to your counsel, that you should never, listen, you should never, let me say this again, you should never offer counsel before first seeking God's counsel. Even if you're in the midst of a conversation and a friend comes to you, take a pause. Pray with that friend. Step away and take a breath. Look in Scripture. Seek God's counsel. Because foolish, emotion-driven counsel usually leads others in the wrong direction. And it brings dishonor to the Lord. And it very well could cause you to say things that you just really shouldn't say. We see this from Job's three friends. They, they speak. And they allow the emotion of the moment to guide their words in a way that's dishonoring and it's ungodly counsel. Proverbs chapter 29 says this. This is verse 20. Do you see someone who speaks in haste? (laughs) There is more hope for a fool than for them. I've underlined that one in my Bible. Look at Job chapter 42 because here's where it comes to. This will be a great read for you this week. I'm going to encourage you throughout the week. We're we're reading a, a proverb a day together, and we're giving you the 52 and 22. But a great study. Listen, church, and then we'll look at this final passage in the end of chapter 42 in the book of Job. A great study for you and your family this week would just be to read through the entirety of this book. It's a, it's a long read. And you probably won't be able to do this in all the studies. There's 150 chapters in the book of Psalm. That'd be a, that'd be a tough get through in one week. I get this. But you could skim it. Or you could tackle it all. But I want to encourage you. There's so much, obviously, we don't get. But what we do see is this back and forth. For 20-plus chapters between Job and his friends, they offer advice, and then he gives a rebuttal. Then they offer advice, and he gives a rebuttal. And then God jumps in, and Job wonders, God, are you really in it with me? And then Job comes to the conclusion of being the man that we know he is and that God has labeled him to be in Scripture. And he says these final words in Job chapter 42, verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former. Actually, this is what God did here. But look look at verse 2. I don't even know if I got that on the screen. Do we have verse 2 on the screen, Brian? Do we? Great. Guys, look at verse 2. Job replies to all that has happened before we see what God did. Look at verse 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I know you can do all things. This is Job speaking. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. And you asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Job spoke in haste. He was frustrated. He was broken. He'd lost loved ones and he's hurting and he misspoke. Things too wonderful for me to know, he says. You said, listen now, verse 4, and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent. He says some things he shouldn't have and he repents. And look at verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Are you kidding me? He was already so blessed. Well, now he has 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys, and he also had 10 more children. Isn't this beautiful? Seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named, I'm not sure why someone would name their daughter this, but he named her Jemimiah. If your name is Jemimiah, I'm so sorry. It's a beautiful name. The second... Name was Keziah, and the third, some people might say Karen, but I believe it is Kareen Hapush. What an interesting name, Kareen Hapush. I found this also to be very interesting and humorous that we don't, we don't hear the dudes' names. We don't know the names of the boys, but we know the names of the girls. Nowhere in the land, here's what we know about the ladies, where they're found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. Hmm. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers, and after this, 
Job lived 140 years, and he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. What a blessing. And so Job died, an old man and full of his years. That term full of his years in Hebrew means fully blessed. Hey, let me give you three takeaways. They're on the screen real fast, and we're going to pray. Number one, it's important to note, guys, God may allow. He may allow me to go through extreme circumstances, through difficult times to accomplish his will. God may allow me to go through extremely difficult times to accomplish his will. God has a right to do what God desires. Secondly, God may allow circumstances to unfold in my life for which I never fully have an answer. That's really important to note. And then lastly, number three, God is working in ways to which I may never be privy for his glory and for my good. Job had no idea that behind the scenes, up in heaven, on two different occasions, that God, the God of all things, the creator of all things, was having a conversation with the greatest adversary of the world about Job. He never knew this. You see, it is very possible that we're going to go through some tough times and we're not fully going to have the answers. But God works in ways, oftentimes, unbeknownst to us, for his glory and for our good. Amen. What wisdom in these literatures. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the story of this man who lost seemingly everything and had a wife who told him to go die. But he never stopped trusting you. Lord, I pray that no matter what we go through, that we too would be like Job to live blameless and to live upright and to be a people of character who trust you no matter what. In your name, amen. We stand with you.